how much alcohol is perfectly okay? You know, if you've heard uh, my show, you've heard, seen me on uh, YouTube and Instagram, I haven't drunk since 2010. Uh, not that I drank a lot beforehand, but I just quit for health reasons, feel a million dollars because I haven't drunk. Uh, but people are always asking me, you know, how much alcohol is okay? Can I just have the occasional drink? Is it all right if I go out and get blind drunk on the weekend and I'll still be all right? <laughs> Everyone's always looking for like, how much can I have? It's like, don't take my beer away from me. Don't take my wine away from me. So today we're going to look at it from a, uh, a medical point of view, if you like, a physical nutrition point of view. How does alcohol actually affect your health? How much is okay? Can we just have one or two drinks or is that awful, terrible? Uh, and if it isn't, how much can we have? And what happens to the body when we drink alcohol? And to help us figure that out, I've brought in a fellow by the name of Ben Kuma, who is a performance nutritionist and educator. He's the host of Ben Kuma Radio in iTunes. He's a British lad. He's over just outside of London right now. Ben, how are you, mate? Great to, great to speak to you. Hello. Oh, mate, thank you for welcoming me onto the show. Thank yeah, you. Great to have you. Now, you and I are both uh, we're fellow ruggers, aren't we? For the, for the uninitiated, that means rugby players. I played rugby for 20 years in Australia. I played for Chiswick Rugby Club over in London and then played for Los Angeles Rugby Club for, Club for a couple of years. And you play rugby at the moment, right, Ben? I do, yeah. Currently still playing. I'm, I'm still in... I've still got all my limbs intact, so as long as they're intact, I'll chase the egg. <laughs> Who do you play for and what position do you play? Oh, mate, I just play for my local team. We're kind of uh, Eastern Counties, which is uh, just below the London Leagues before National. Um, mm -hmm. So we're like basically eight leagues from the top uh, professional rugby. I play number nine. So I'm the, I'm the gobby one that runs around telling everyone what to do um, <laughs> and being the link between the backs and the forwards. Uh, mate, I love, you know, it's my kind of social and physical outlet. Um, mm -hmm. You'll understand that, you know, the team environment, the community, it gives me focus in the gym as well. You know, I've got a reason to be in the gym rather than just looking good naked. So, you know, I think sport's an incredible thing and rugby, yeah, it just gives me that buzz. Yeah. Now, one thing that people associate rugby with, obviously, is the camaraderie and the post-match drink or the post-match drinking session. Um, certainly, when I played rugby in uh, Australia, England and in the USA, um, you know, it was almost like at the end of the game, you shower, you've gone into battle, you feel amazing afterwards or, you, feel, you know, you might be a bit injured or sore, but, you, you know, the endorphins are coming through. And so what happens afterwards, you go straight to the pub and then you drink lots and lots of beer. And a lot of the times the, the MVP, the most valuable player, will have to chug a pitcher of beer or a pint of beer and there's some beer games and things in, in, in many clubs. Not all of them, but in many. Um, and so that kind of drink, drinking a lot of beer and camaraderie is very much associated with the sport. Do you find that as well in, in your local pub team and have you over, over the years? And, and how much beer or alcohol do you drink in, in general? Sure. I mean, in our club, uh, when I was younger, so what, I'm 29 now, now, when I was younger, I played with them before I went to university, there was a, there was a lot more of a drinking culture. And purely because uh, the people in the club were younger, they wanted to play the game, they wanted to go out afterwards, all go into town as a team and stuff and, you know, pick up chicks and do whatever. Mm. Um, and that, that was the culture and the kind of team is all gradually aged and there's a lot less younger people. So there's a lot more like, oh, no, I'm driving or I've got to go to me nan's birthday party or I've got to go and do this. So there, there is less, but, you know, the culture's still there. And I think the, the big part of it is, is, is the social aspect. And I know there's this kind of counter argument of like, we well, don't need to drink to be sociable and you don't. But ultimately there is nothing wrong with having a, a pint of beer or two as long as you know it's not affecting other things and you know I'll finish the game I'll quite often have a protein shake because I don't I don't have an appetite after the game I don't really like whole food I'll eat later I'll have a protein shake and then I'll go to the bar and I'll have a pint with all my friends you know we'll, mm -hmm. we'll share stories about the game whinge about uh, what part of our limbs are falling off mm -hmm. um, as a result of battle and you know I think this is kind of, you know this leads into me summarizing I suppose my view on alcohol is that we know it's a toxin to the body. We know it has negative side effects. We know it affects people in different ways. We know it can be a crutch 
for some people in terms of making them feel good, lowering their inhibitions, all sorts of stuff. Now, if people consume alcohol for the wrong reasons to, to kind of get something that their life has not provided, then, then that's the first negative because the way that we think our psychology, our mindset is paramount to our optimal health, the way we view our body and the actions that we take every day. And then secondly to that, as long as we can manage the health component of it now, yes, it's a toxin. So if you consume too much, there'll be a negative side effect at a point and that'll be different in certain people. Like if I have two or three drinks, I'm fine. Anything more than three drinks, and I'm going to pay for it in some way. Bit tired, feel quite dehydrated in the morning, you know, a couple of things. I'm just not 100%. So I never really go over that barrier unless I've made a conscious decision to say, do you know what? I'm going for a night out, you know, I'm going out with my friends, with, you know, and that happens like every three or four months. And to me, it, it doesn't bother me because it happens so infrequently. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I manage the effects of the alcohol uh, and largely in terms of someone being uh, interested in body composition, I'll also manage the caloric impact of that. Mm. So if I want three pints of beer and I'm drinking, you know, Heineken, for example, I know that there's 280 calories in a pint and that's got quite a caloric damage to my daily intake. And that's something I'm aware of. So I kind of account for it and I, I make it part of, uh, you know, my daily calorie intake. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of how I sum up alcohol. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, I am the creator of the 30 day, no alcohol challenge. And I encourage people to just to quit for 30 days, just to see and feel the immense health benefits that, that people get from it. But I never say people should quit drinking forever. I mean, I've taken a pretty, what is considered to many a radical stance, which is I just stopped drinking. I just haven't drunk in five and a half years. Um, and I feel amazing because of it. I'm sure I could go and have a few beers and a couple of wines and I'd be perfectly okay. My life wouldn't change that much. But the 30 day no alcohol challenge is really to just knock people out of this routine where they've got the habit of drinking two, three drinks a night or a drink here or binge drinking on the weekends and going past those three days. So I'm never saying quit drinking and alcohol's the devil and never drink again. It's more like just take a slowly but surely routine. Pretty much what you just described, the occasional drink here um, is absolutely fine. But what I really want to figure out uh, now is how does alcohol actually affect our health? When we actually take in a drink, whether it's a beer or a wine or a liquor, and we put these toxins into our body, what is actually going on in our body when, when, we, when we consume that, Ben, from a, from a, sort of a, from a health point of view? What, what, what's going on? Sure. Um, before I actually answer that, I just want to pick up on the point you made about your challenge and the kind, of, the, mm. the kind of rationale because I'm a massive believer in making people or showing people how good they can feel. Yes. And that, that's basically what you're doing. Your program's going, let's take all this away because I, I believe you'll get more energy, you'll sleep better. Um, God, your, your sex drive will probably improve, like loads of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that. That's why I try and get people to eat a whole food, really good diet as possible for a really good stretch of time mm-hmm. to show them that when they eat a bad food, well, let's not, let's not call it bad because we don't want to label foods in that manner. But when we eat a food that might have a negative physiological effect and it affects us in some way, just like alcohol, I want you to see how that makes you feel. And I call it the spectrum of health. So uh, people oscillate between feeling all right and feeling a bit pants every day. And you want to increase that spectrum of health where they start feeling really good every day. So when they go back to that feeling of you know, pretty pants, they're like, oh my, like, that's how I used to feel. Mm. I used to feel like that nearly every day. And that's kind of, for me, the realization for people of how powerful nutrition and lifestyle intervention is. Um, so your question, uh, how does alcohol, uh, you know, what, what happens when we consume it? Now, I'm, I'm not an alcohol expert. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I will preface this. So, you know, alcohol comes into the body. It's processed by the liver. Now, when we consume alcohol, the toxins will slow down the rate at which everything else happens in the body. So it now now creates basically a toxic burden on the body for a period of time. So that's why the severity of what we do uh, in terms of the amount of drinks we have will usually lead to a worse and worse hangover because your body is still going, man, I've still got to get through all this stuff. I've got this like, you know, the, the garbage can, which is toxins is overflowing. So I've got to get through this now. I use an example in myself that I know if I have three drinks, it's absolutely fine. 
by the time my body's reached seven o'clock the next morning, all those toxins are gone. I'm not really dehydrated. Now, as soon as I start having four or five, my headache might get worse. My tiredness might get worse. Seven, eight, nine, I'm going to start feeling a bit queasy because your body is having to deal with all this stuff on top of all the other stuff it's having to do through your diet. Now, if your diet is not very good, doesn't have a lot of nutrition, antioxidants, factors that can help flush toxins through the liver, you're going to struggle even more. You're, you're, and that's when people's hangover might be, you know, two days, three days, because their body's efficiency to process the toxins won't be as good. Right. Um, in actual fact, the National Institute of Health over here in the US says it takes up to seven days for the body to remove the toxins from alcohol, um, which is pretty extraordinary. Essentially, what they're saying is, is that you have a beer or a glass of wine or liquor, those toxins are staying in your system for seven days afterwards. Now, you might, might not even feel the effect of that, but there are still remnants of that drink floating around your system for those days. So if you're wanting to, to work and be at a, a live in an optimum level, even if you have a drink a week ago, you're still probably just cleaning out some of the toxins in there. Okay. So, um, I, I always look at it like this. I always just say plain and plain and simple. Alcohol is a poison, plain and simple. It's, it's a poison. Now it can give you this temporary pleasure. Okay. Gives you this illusion, if you like, of a temporary high, but you are going to pay for that. You're going to pay for that afterwards. And like you said, Ben, um, it slows down the rate of everything else in the body. Like you said, it creates a toxic burden on the body for a period of time. So that's going to affect the way that your uh, metabolism works, your ability to be able to burn fat. Um, it's just going to make you lethargic. Um, and again, the occasional drink here and there, no big deal really. But if you're doing that with regularity, things start to get a little bit different, right, Ben? Oh, definitely. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, it's the consistency to a good lifestyle that leads to even more ongoing improvements. And it's the same with alcohol and, in, you know, negative uh, habits that we, if we consistently do that, it creeps up on us. We're not going to get into that really good positive catch 22 cycle where f we're feeling good every day. Um, you know, it would be very easy for you to start having, you know, one or two drinks once or twice a week. And then that lifestyle habit might change to two or three times a week, three or four times a week because you're not seeing any effects. And because that change will be so gradual, you'll never really see the full ramifications till you have a bit of a rain check one day and go, actually, no, I'm, I'm operating at 90% now. I'm not, I'm not really feeling this. Mm. Um, so I think anything when it comes to anything negative that we have in our diet, because, and, th and this is where the, the, the kind of ambiguity comes with kind of, we'll call it bad stuff. We'll call it alcohol processed food, toxins on our air, toxins in the shower gel, all this kind of stuff. It's very hard to draw a line where this stuff actually has a negative effect. Like all the deodorants that we're using, at what point is that level that we spray all that stuff on our skin going to have a negative effect? And it's kind of that unknown. And that's why I think you would agree with me in that everyone always has to listen to their body. You have to listen to the messages coming out the back end and that if something is honestly having even a slightly negative effect, you know that your body's going to be under stress. Yeah. Now at that point in time, that stress might not be a problem. But when more and more stress comes into the tank, because stress accumulates in the same way, that bathtub and the taps are running, which is stress, is going to overflow because your body is at a point where it's, you know, it's not it's not in a state to kind of fight it. And I use the same with overtraining. I think overtraining in the fitness industry is a big problem, especially I teach an awful lot of personal trainers. And I know that personal trainers are training all the time, running around, working all the time, and not looking after their health. Now, that's fine if you're just pulling through every day and you're just on the edge of like overtraining all the time. But you get one or two night bad sleep, something happens in your work environment, you have an emotional upset, and bam, you're in a place where it's going to take you so much longer to recover because you're always on the edge yeah. of being in that hyper-stress state. And it, you know, it's the same with alcohol. Like alcohol can put the body in a place where it's, it's always struggling to keep on top of things. And that's why I think the, the best feedback tool we have is just honestly listening to our body and all the kind of symptoms and daily fluctuations it has. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're waking up tired and lethargic and you're having a restless night, 
then maybe it's just the, the glass of alcohol you have the night before. I always say this. People don't understand. People go, oh, I've got sleep problems. I've got sleep apnea. Oh, there must be something wrong. Um, I'm really stressed at the moment. And they don't realize that it's actually, in many cases, the nightly glass of wine before they go to sleep. Because here's the thing. Alcohol may actually help you go to sleep quicker, like you drink it yeah. and I'll let you go to sleep. But it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't get into that good REM sleep. You should be nap. There's a cycle to the way that you fall asleep. There's a cycle to the way that you sleep 90 minutes after being asleep. There's a cycle to the way that you're sleeping an hour and a half before you wake up. And so that drink may indeed knock you out and like make you go to sleep, but you're not, it's not the way that you're supposed to. To sleep and so you might still get seven or eight hours but when you wake up because you've gone to sleep the wrong way you're feeling tired and lethargic and a little bit irritable so i always try to point out like all it takes is just one simple glass of wine or one beer each night that little habit can literally be having a huge effect on everything to do with your life your sleep pattern, you wake up tired, you're grumpy, you're irritable, that affects your relationships. You're not as productive, that affects how much money you make. You're not as happy, that affects the people who come into your life because happy people attract other happy people. If you're unhappy, you will attract unhappy people. And then so it's this whole big spin-off effect. Um, now, having said all that, I don't want to be bashing on alcohol completely, right? I am bashing on the habit of drinking alcohol but the occasional drink is, is okay. So for the listener or, or the viewer who wants to have the occasional drink, let's figure out what is okay and what is not okay. What drinks have the most calories and are the, are the worst for you then? And which drinks uh, have the least, uh, you know, the least the detrimental effects for you? And just before you answer that, just a reminder, we're talking to Ben Coomer. Uh, you can find him at bencoomer.com, B-E-N-C-O-O-M-B-E-R. You can follow him on Twitter at, uh, at Ben Coomer. Uh, he's a nutritionist and educator, uh, and he's got the UK's number one health and fitness podcast on iTunes, so make sure you check him out at the Ben Coomer Radio, or at Ben Coomer Radio, I should say. So, Ben, what, what's, what has the least amount of calories in alcohol? What has the, has the worst? So any time a drink has a higher alcohol volume, it has more calories. So if you can compare volume, let's say a pint of beer to liquor, if, even if you've only had, tw if you've had 25 mils of liquor, then that is going to be less calories than a pint of beer. But volume wise, if you had a pint of liquor, then there's tons more calories in that. So for example, you might have a gin and slimline tonic and it might only have about eight cal 80 calories, which is a drink for most people. Now, if you have a pint of cider, which is again, a drink for most people, it can be up to 300 calories because cider is so high in sugar because um, the way it's processed, the, the fermentation, etc. cetera. Um, so kind of like, um, you know, yeah, beer, beer and cider are basically the most calorific. There are some lower calorie beers, like Heineken is very ca low calorie, uh, sorry, high calorie. Budweiser is about half the calories of Heineken. It's a lot lower. Um, so I think in terms of like what's okay, I think people obviously want to be aware of the calories. Like it's very rare I drink cider purely because I know how calorie calorific it is, and that steals food from my diet, and I like food. Mm. Um, so I tend to go for like a, a kind of a mid-range beer or I have like a, a gin and tonic, gin and slimline tonic or absolutely love wine. Um, and, and wine's kind of in the middle, you know, smaller glass of wine, you're looking at um, sort of 150 calories and then it'll just increase with the, the size of the bottle basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. Um, if you have a large glass of wine, a Pinot Grigio, there's about 225 calories in there. That's the same number of calories you get from like a, a ring donut, from a chocolate donut if you're buying. So I like to use this analogy. Um, when, I, when people go out on a Friday night at the end of work and they have five, six drinks, they're essentially putting about a thousand calories into them at least a thousand calories. And that is the equivalent of say four or five donuts um, or three or four slices of pizza. And when you use that analogy and you try to have people understand that, then they're like, oh my God. So every time I'm going out on a Friday night, I'm essentially eating a, a pack of Krispy Kreme donuts or a, a box of Krispy Kreme donuts or half a pizza. 
Now, most people, when they have four or five drinks, they have half the pizza with the, with the drinks or they're more likely to have the kebab on the way home. If you're in London, there's all those like Turkish kebab stores outside of underground, outside of underground mm-hmm. stations. People are always eating those things at the last minute. Um, so, so know that, again, if you have the occasional beer, the occasional Heineken, the occasional glass of wine, 150, 300 calories here or there, no big deal. But when you start getting up to three or four glasses, then you're starting to put in like boxes of crispy green donuts into you. And if you can just remember that, maybe that'll prevent you from, you know, going overboard each, each time. Right, Ben? Definitely. And I think off the back end of that, if you have one, two, possibly three drinks, I don't think it would lead to too much um, effect in terms of blood sugar level. Mm. But as soon as you start to have too many drinks or too many drinks that are sugary, if, 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 that, if, if you haven't eaten for a while, then you're going to become hyperglycemic very quickly because of the amount of sugar in it. Mm. So that's when you walk out of the bar and go, oh my God, I'm absolutely starving because your blood sugar level is so low from the drinking. And that's when people make bad choices because when we're really hungry, what does your body crave? You crave sugar. It's just a natural response. It's not, it's not you not having a lack of willpower or anything. The body is naturally designed to eat something that will very quickly digest uh, into energy. And that's quite often sugar or something that's very calorie dense. Um, so that's when you know the alcohol could be a big problem is that we have a couple and it makes us want to go and eat all the stuff that we don't really or shouldn't eat. Yeah, it's not necessarily the alcohol that you're drinking that's causing you the the caloric problem. It's the crap food that you eat because you've had the two or three drinks, right? Right. The blood sugar levels are low. Now you want to eat. Now it's easier to grab the Snickers bar from the gas station. Now it's easier to grab the pack of Doritos or the Cheetos or whatever. Or the oh, let's just get a quick slice of pizza. Especially if you're in New York City, there's pizza places all around the place. Everyone's walking. It's a walking city. It's easy to just, you know, fall out of a pub or a bar and just go, Oh, just grab a quick slice of pizza. That's where all the problem lies. Um, from a calorie point of view, tequila, uh, as I understand it is actually got the least number of calories in it and is the, is the cleanest. Were you aware of that, Ben? Uh, well, yeah, it is. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get really excited about it. If you start to compare it to whiskey, you know, gin, that kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's not that different. Mm. Um, you know, if, if it's a 40% ABV, then it's going to be very similar to another 40% ABV alcohol, which is like vodka, for example. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, it's not going to be much different. Uh, I know that, um, the paleo community got really excited uh, over this for a while and everyone was recommending drinking uh, tequila, lime and soda um, because it meant you could sort of have more, uh, so to speak. So, yeah, but I, you know, I think we're looking at you know, very small margins there. Okay. What, what foods should we be eating uh, before a drinking session? Let's say someone knows they're going to go out, they're going to have at least a few drinks. What foods should they be eating and when? Uh, to try and limit the the pain or suffering they're going to feel or just, you know, to keep their, their sugar levels in, in check? Now, if someone, if someone wants to feel drunk, then, you know, and, and that's why some people drink, simple as, then not eating a huge amount is going to mean that you're going to spend less money. Um, now, if you're someone that wants a couple of drinks and doesn't really want to feel the ill effects or doesn't want to have to, or doesn't want the feelings where they're going to eat bad food afterwards, then I would say you want something very fibrous, something that's going to fill you up. You definitely want a protein source in there. You definitely want a couple of very fibrous vegetables. And then in terms of carbohydrate and fat intake, I think you need something that kind of works for you. So when I teach diet and nutrition, I teach people to eat kind of a macronutrient balance that makes them feel good. Um, so we don't want fluctuations in energy. So I want something very fiber, fibrous, uh, protein, uh, good protein content that's going to fill people up. Then that way, hopefully, we our blood sugar levels keep nice and stable um, uh, throughout that kind of uh, couple of drinks. Now, if anything, you might want to err on the side of it being slightly lower carb because you're going to have a load of carbs in the alcohol. So if you had a high carb meal and then loads of carbs in the alcohol, again, that might have a bigger effect on your blood glucose levels and lead to more, more kind of negative effects. So I think kind of a protein, veggie, low, lowish carb approach before you eat would be solid. 
Okay. So pro- when you're talking protein, it can be something like chicken breast, piece of steak, fish. Is that what you're referring to? Yep. A hundred percent. And if anything, you, you might want to err on the side of a lower calorie meat, like chicken, turkey, fish, because you might want to be trying to offset the calories that you're going to drink from the alcohol. Okay. If you start having steak, sweet potatoes, cooked in coconut oil and this kind of stuff, then you might really struggle to kind of, you know, keep your calories within check. Okay. And when you say fibrous vegetables, what's the difference between fibrous vegetables and vegetables? Or how do you, how do you separate that? What do you mean? Yeah, so there's some vegetables that are, have a greater fiber content than others. Um, but same with fruits. Uh, like, for example, um, if, if a fruit or a vegetable tends to have a tougher, a rougher texture um, and less fluid in it, in terms of fluid when you eat it in the mouth, it tends to have more fiber. So, for example, an orange is something that's really juicy, doesn't really have a much kind of cellular structure, doesn't really have much fiber, only has about uh, 1.5 grams, I think, per orange. Now, a mango, when you eat a mango, there's all this stringy stuff in it, all this fibrous material that you almost have to chew through despite it being juicy. That's an indication that it's got a lot more fiber. So there are loads of tables on the internet that people can download, you know, type into Google fiber in vegetables, and you'll just see per 100 grams all these fibrous vegetables. And just try and pick, you know, vegetables that have um, a good fiber content because, you know, we all need that, we all know that we need to eat a lot of fiber to be healthy. It's good for the gastrointestinal tract. So to focus on these kind of vegetables in their diet would be a good thing anyway. Okay, so before you're going drinking protein, vegetables, we're talking about chicken, turkey, fish, and fibrous vegetables. Even if you're not going drinking, you should be eating this stuff anyway. What about mm-hmm. post session? People wake up with a hangover in the morning, they've got a headache, they're dehydrated. A lot of people, especially when I lived in the UK, it was like, let's go for a greasy breakfast. You know, let's go get bacon, eggs, toast, baked beans. You know, the greasy breakfast will cure the hangover. Other people like to drink Gatorade. Um, or Powerade or any of that kind of stuff. Um, some people go for pancakes. I've got a, a, f- a famous pancake place here called the Griddle Cafe here on Sunset Boulevard near where I live. And that's, there's always got a line out the, out the side of that, um, you know, 50 yards up the street on Sunset Boulevard every Saturday and Sunday morning of people there ready to go and smash a whole big all-you-can-eat pancakes uh, with whipped cream and, and uh, uh, what's the maple syrup and sugar and all this kind of stuff. Um, so what's, what's the worst thing we can eat to, to cure a hangover and what should we be eating to cure a hangover? Uh, I don't think there's a perfect answer. There is nothing that you're going to eat that's going to cure your hangover. It's simple as that. The body's got to be given time to produce, reduce those toxins and flush them out of the liver. The big thing your body's going to want when uh, it's hungover is fluids and fluids with electrolytes in it and maybe a little bit of sugar. Um, so drinking, you know, very mineral rich water is going to help. You can put a little bit of honey in that as well. You could drink something like coconut water or maple water, which I know is starting to come into the market. That is going to help uh, rehydrate the cells faster, help the liver flush out toxins. But, you know, again, when you come to breakfast and this is the same whether you've got a hangover or not, you should be eating a breakfast that makes you feel good that makes you energized. The worst thing you want to do when you're hungover is eat a meal that kind of looks like a good idea on the surface because it's going to give you that momentary satisfaction. Like, you know, you want the fry up, you want the pancakes, whatever. If that's going to make you feel even worse, even more tired, your hangover is just going to suck even more. So hydration and just a a meal that makes you feel good. As I understand it, when you're hungover, you're actually, your body is inflamed. And so any kind of anti-inflammatory food, uh, I, I, I'm loath to say this, but pill like ibuprofen can also help you. So fish oil, even just taking a few extra fish oil uh, uh, pills, w- which reduces inflammation can certainly help. And then I've been t- told ibuprofen or any kind of anti-inflammatory can also help uh, with a hangover. Is that your understanding, Ben? Um, that is true to a degree. I personally wouldn't recommend an ibuprofen. Um, I don't think it's something that people should take unless it's really necessary. I think there, uh, you'd be a lot better off taking curcumin, which has very similar and pretty much identical effects to ibuprofen in a way in terms of 
the effect on the inflammatory pathways in the body. Like curcumin is incredible. Um, I've, not, I've not heard of uh, curcumin before. Is that like turmeric? Is that is that the same thing? Yeah, turmeric. Yeah, so it's the it's the active compound in turmeric. Right. So getting some of that into your breakfast would be amazing. Like if, you know, we're now talking about kind of almost aid in the body in this kind of inflammatory state. You know, something like a smoothie in the morning might be really good. So a little bit of protein powder, some frozen berries, some spinach. Um, you know, you might get a curcumin or turmeric capsule so you didn't have to put curry powder in your, your smoothie. Um, you know, get some uh, coconut water in there. That would be incredible, incredibly hydrating, and it would give you loads of antioxidants to start helping the body mop up all the rubbish that's in the bloodstream. Is curcumin something that you would only take when you're in that inflamed state or can you actually add that into your daily diet? No, you can add it into your daily diet. I recommend it for a huge amount of people, especially people that play a lot of sport or go to the gym because we're constantly in an inflamed state to a degree, but it doesn't have a um, adaptation blocking effect. So for example, uh, antioxidants that are in high doses around training. So if I took... Uh, do you have Barocas over there, like those vitamin C tablets? Yeah, I'm not sure they sell them over here. I know the ones you're talking to are talking about. Yeah, right? so these like fizzy uh, um, airborne. They're called, they're, they're called Airborne over here. That's, that's, that's the big brand. It's called Airborne. You pop the pill, you stick it in a water, and it dissolves and sparkles. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's high dose vitamin C. Now taking that around the training window would blunt the adaptational effects, especially with cardio uh, based activities. So mm. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend any of this stuff around training, but curcumin doesn't seem to have that response. So, yeah, again, I never recommend anything high dose antioxidant wise around a workout, but, you know, in the diet, it just seems to be positive. Mm. All right, I might try that actually. I mean, I have a, I work out in my, my mornings. I know you work out in, in the evenings, don't you? Post 4 p.m., but um, I like to work out in, in, in the morning. And so I'll work out in a fasted state. Um, usually, and when I come back, I'll make in my Vitamix uh, spinach, kale, um, chia seeds, grass-fed butter, coconut oil, um, uh, obviously water and ice, and then I'll throw a maca root and a few other little things there. Some magnesium, a magnesium pill, a couple of vitamin D. I'll just throw throw that in to mix it up there. But um, if I added, curc uh, I'm not even pronouncing it right here, curcumin. If I if I added curcumin post-workout is that going to be beneficial to me ben i'm i'm not going to say yes or no the reason okay. why is i haven't looked at curcumin in the literature around the workout window mm -hmm. now it does affect the inflammatory pathways and the inflammatory pathways you want to be active post-workout to allow adaptation so in theory i would say no i would okay. say it'd be better off taking it later on in the day just in case there is a mechanism. But I think to ease your mind, I would try and look at the data, maybe have a look at examine.com or something to see what the data is saying. Okay. okay. It yeah. has quite a potent effect on inflammatory pathways. That's why they're now doing a lot of research in people with gut issues, osteoarthritis, and mm. joint conditions, blood-based conditions with curcumin with you know nice positive results. Why is Gatorade or Powerade or any of those kind of sports drinks, why is that bad for a hangover or just in, in general? Because it's going to play around with your blood sugar levels a lot. Um, so, you know, it's raw sugar. Raw sugar is not, I wouldn't say it's bad per se. Sugar is the component that gets broken down from carbohydrates. So we can't label sugar as bad per se. Now, if we take in a Gatorade, we're taking in an awful lot of energy that has no positive nutritional value. It's just pure sugar. Now, when you're hungover, the sugars will help a little bit um, because your blood sugar level will be very low. But if you have a lot of that, you're going to become hyperglycemic very quickly. Um, so that's why I would only ever recommend something like a Gatorade when you're doing intensive training or for a long duration because it has a role. Um, you know, they make these drinks for a reason, but the, the reason isn't to walk around sitting on the couch, driving the car, or when you fancy a sweet drink, to have 250 calories in a sweet sports drink. They're designed to be for during intensive training. So I think it's going to lead someone to have not very good energy. Orange juice? What's wrong with orange juice? Well, 
calorie and sugar wise, it's basically the same as a Gatorade. Mm-hmm. A Gatorade side by side is going to have the same amount of calories as orange juice. Most fruit juices are, tend to have around 10 grams of sugar per 100 mils. Mm-hmm. So if you pick up a five and half a half a liter bottle, that's a lot of calories from just mm-hmm. pure sugar. Mm. it's extraordinary isn't it like when you learn this stuff as i have in the last sort of few years it's it's actually everything you think you know is wrong like this idea that you should drink powerade and gatorade to reduce your hangover is wrong because you're just putting more sugar into your body this idea that you should go and have a greasy breakfast and have a big glass of orange juice you're just putting sugar in your body this idea that if you're sick i'll oh, drink lots of orange juice you know it's got lots of vitamin c it'll make you feel better it's a nonsense you're just putting a whole bunch of sugar into your body like you're actually making yourself worse by, by drinking this stuff. And when you learn this, you just, you just go, how the hell did our culture and our society ever convince us that this stuff was good in the first place? There are brilliant marketers out there who've just made it so part of the human psyche almost that you should have a glass of you know, dairy milk with your cereal in the morning and a nice glass of orange juice. I mean, the traditional American breakfast now, which is like cow's milk, cereal, and a glass of orange juice, which you see all these smiling kids in the TV commercials having fun, the mums giving them the food. You just look at that and you just go, that is the worst possible shit you could be feeding your children. Would you mm-hmm. agree with that, Ben? Oh, definitely, definitely. And I think it's sad. Like, um, I've, I've actually got a post planned on Facebook in the fact that I... Um, I quite often eat peppers, just like an apple. Mm. And I always get the strangest looks. And I'm like, oh my God, you're eating a pepper like that. And I'm like, at what point did our society yeah. get, get to a level where eating something that I pick off a plant that's natural is weird compared to if I picked up a chocolate bar that's completely normal. Yeah. But you know, that's, we've been brainwashed by Big Pharma, by companies that have a lot of money to make us think like that. And it, it is sad. And, you know, it's kind of painful in a way working in our industry because uh, common sense is very uncommon. (laughs) Let me read the label of this box. And I wonder if it's beneficial for my child. I wonder if it's appropriate. You know, you pick up lucky charms, like what's in it apart from the added fortified vitamins that they've put in it that is beneficial to a child's health. Zero. Uh, I mean, I mean, I was in Whole Foods, which is seemingly one of the healthiest stores in the U.S. here yesterday. There's a Whole Foods on Santa Monica Boulevard, the corner of Santa Monica and Fairfax in West Hollywood. And it's extraordinary. You go into that store and you look at the packaging and you look at the things and there's all the labels saying low fat yogurt. And you go, well, that's not good for you because it's full of sugar anyway and it should be high fat. Um, You've got low fat milk. Well, if you're going to drink milk, drink almond milk. Like don't drink dairy in, in the first place. Then you've got, um, you know, uh, full of the cereal, full of nutrients and vitamin C and vitamin B and all this complex carbohydrates and all this kind of crap. And you're just like, this is just the biggest scam in history. It's like this fa- these fancy words to try and trick you into believing that what you are eating or drinking is healthy. And most of the time, it is complete garbage and is, is having an adverse effect on your health how do we how do we prevent ourselves i mean education is obviously the key here right ben but to the person who's going into the store going shopping how does this person you know it's it's you versus the supermarket how do you beat the supermarket when you walk into the supermarket well if you're a general consumer i think you know it's tough because we're competing with people that have so much more power than us and influence and clever tactics and stuff but I just think so much of us need to exercise more common sense. The way you walk around a supermarket and you, you, you buy for your health is look at a product and go, is there health giving properties to this product? Did it once live? Did it once grow? Did it once swim? Was it, you know, farmed and harvested or was it made in a lab? Has it had 20 ingredients added to it? Has it had stuff added to it to make, or flavor it to the product it originally was before it was grown on a tree and stuff. And I think if we can start to exercise this level of, you know, common sense, I think people will be far better off. But, you know, in change, if you want to change something, you've got to actively and consciously focus on that element of change. And when people walked around the supermarket, 
they're just on autopilot. They walk down this aisle, they grab that, they walk down this aisle, the child shouts, hey, mum, grab that. They just grab it and they pay and they leave. Whereas people don't often go into the supermarket and go, right, you know, I'm looking for healthy, nutritious food. What do I need to get? I need to buy some proteins. Right, let's go down the aisle. Like, and, and until you engage in that and start to exercise common sense, you're never really going to get anywhere. You're not looking and accepting that change. Well, to get common sense, it all starts with education. So uh, uh, make sure you listen to Ben Kuma Radio in iTunes. Obviously, if you uh, follow my podcast, The James Swanick Show, or you follow me on YouTube at James Swanick, You'll see that I do a lot of stuff on this on health and nutrition. I've had a lot of health experts on the show um, as well. It all starts with education. Just open your eyes, please. Open your eyes. Understand that, um, and understand that a lot of the the fancy terminology that that these companies are putting on there, like low fat, healthy, you know, um, you know, FDA approved, all this kind of nonsense. It's just a lot of the time, it's still crap for you. It's still awful for you. So, just make sure you keep listening, keep following people like Ben. Uh, other experts and educate yourself because it will it will change your life. So just to uh, to summarize what we're talking about here on alcohol, Ben, and then we'll we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, obviously, when you drink alcohol, toxins slow down the rate of everything else in the body. It does create a toxic burden on the body for a period of time. Um, but as Ben says, it's okay if you're going to have the occasional drink. You can have a couple drinks; it's fine. It's no big deal. But when you start to use it as a crutch for social occasions, you start to use it as a habit. Long term, you're just putting poison and toxins into your body, which are going to slow you down. From a, a caloric point of view, obviously, if you're drinking straight liquor like a like a tequila or vodka, that's obviously going to be a little bit better for you than if you're drinking pints of beer and cider, which can have 300 calories in them and a lot of sugar. Uh, if you are going to go for beer, Budweiser has got half the calories as Heineken, uh, obviously. But again, just look at the label. You, that's one thing you can determine like they are very stringent and very um, strict on saying how many calories in each beer just look at it go for a light beer maybe um, in terms of the foods you eat before drinking um, ben suggests to eat lots of protein to keep your blood sugar levels stable things like um, chicken turkey fish and then fibrous vegetables things like uh, or fruits as well We're talking about um, ben used the example of, of mango there which is um, you know quite fi fibrous and then if you've got a hangover and you're dehydrated lots of fluids okay Coconut water, maple water, maybe a bit of uh, cur cur I'm going to get the pronunciation on again. Curcumin, curcumin, curcumin. Yep. Um, you can have a smoothie, protein powder, spinach, berries, coconut water. Please avoid the Gatorade and the Powerade. Please avoid the greasy breakfast. Please avoid the the uh, the the the, uh, the orange juice because all you're doing is just putting more sugar into you, and you're going to have another insulin spike, and you're going to feel like crap after that as well. Does that pretty much cover it, Ben? That is spot on. All right. You said it. All right. Well, Ben Coomer, thank you so much. Make sure you check out Ben Coomer at Ben Coomer Radio, the podcast in iTunes. Check him out at bencoomer.com. Make sure you send him a tweet at Ben Coomer right now and just let him know what you got out of this. And I'm sure he will, he will retweet that. Ben, I enjoyed talking to you very much, sir. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, guys, uh, if you want to engage, just get on Twitter, uh, tweet me and James, tell us what you thought of the show. It's nice to get engagement from people after the show, their opinions. Maybe, maybe even tell us what you're going to change as a result of today. Like put your hand up and go, do you know what? That really hit home. I'm going to, I'm going to go away and I'm going to think about this stuff. And it's good to think that these things don't fall on deaf ears. Yeah. So just tweet out one thing that you learned today and just put me in there at James Swanick and at Ben Coomer and we'll, uh, we'll answer and respond and retweet. Ben, thank you very much, sir, from one rugger to another from <laughs> across the pond. Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And to the viewer and the listener, I will catch you on the next one.